If you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that name, I am named after Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, my parents were Germans. My mother grew up in Schlesien, which is part of Poland, and after the war they had to flee, as many Germans fled, and they went back to the Black Forest where my grandfather was from, and that's where my mother met my father. They married in 1954 and immigrated to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1955. That's where I was born. But the Lord called my wife and myself back to Germany in 1985 to plant churches. And my goal when I was 20 years old was to plant five churches in Germany before I died. My motto has been five to grow before I go, before I die. And uh, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the time I was 44, we planted the fifth church and I was not dead. I was very confused. My wife was very happy. I said, Lord, what's going on here? I'm supposed to be in heaven. And he said, more to grow before you go. So I was invited by the German Evangelical Free Church to become their head of evangelism and church planting. And our goal for Germany was to plant 100 new churches in 10 years. That was on my desk. We didn't quite make it. We made it to 80 in 10 years. And then I left that position because it was too administrative for my taste um, and became a consultant for church planting in Europe. So um, after 37 years of living in Germany, in February, we moved, moved back to the States. We live in Wheaton, Illinois, caring for my in-laws who are in their mid 90s. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say today about church planting, the biblical um, basis for church planting or theological basis for church planting, you can find in this book, The Jesus Model, Planting Churches the Jesus Way, I wrote it in German and had it translated into English. It's the only book I've ever read that talks about church planting from a Jesus vantage point. All the literature that you find theologically begins with the Acts of the Apostles. I believe Jesus was in his heart a church planter. He said, I will build my church. He did not only say that, I think he did it, and the disciples were the prototype of the first church in Jerusalem. And then two years ago, I wrote a book called Shift, The Road to Level 5 Church Multiplication. So 12 different shifts in doing ministry and especially church planting, shift from organizational to organic church planting. All of the churches in the New Testament are conversion-based church plants. That's not the way that we do it today. We organize church plants. They're, not, they're artificial, they're organizational. They're a shifting of the saints from one location to another, oftentimes. Um, so how do we get back to that? And I've developed a course for postmodern secular Europeans that does that. Um, uh, it's called My Life Workshop. You can find it on the web, mylifeworkshop.net. Um, shift from big to small. God loves the small. Shift from um, a membership to discipleship. Shift from addition to multiplication. These kinds of shifts. So in level five church multiplication, what I mean is there are five different kinds of churches. The first kind are declining churches. Churches that are losing members, they're losing uh, worshipers, they're losing uh, co-workers, they're losing money, they're losing attendance. Then you have plateaued churches. They, from year to year, they, they don't grow, they don't decline, they stay even. Then you have thirdly growing churches or they're adding to their numbers. Then you have fourthly um, reproducing churches. So what is a healthy church? And you may want to write some of this down, not, not everything, but just the main things that God gives you. A healthy church is a church that is healthy enough to reproduce itself. So the fruit of an apple tree is not an apple, it is another apple tree. So the question is always, how healthy is our church? So the fruit of an apple tree is not an apple, it's another apple tree. The fruit of a healthy, healthy church is a church that is healthy enough to reproduce itself. But level five churches would be, in this metaphor, would be an apple orchard. So how do you get involved in being um, a movement church? 
a church that plants many, many churches, and you get to a movement by getting to the fifth generation removed from the first cause, and um, my books talk about that, how to get there. The books are unique because they're written from a European perspective. My, all my theological education has been in the United States, Columbia Bible College, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and Fuller Theological Seminary, where I got my deem in um, on the topic of creating and sustaining a church planting multiplication movement in Germany in a free church context. So, um, but all of my ministry has been in Europe, and so uh, that's where I'm at. What you need to know is that 80% of all churches in the Western world are either declining and plateaued. What we need is not only to plant many, many new churches, we need to get to go from addition to movement. So that is a big challenge that we face. And then to plant conversion-based churches. But let's talk about, in this session, let's talk about a theology of church planting. Um, where do we start? We start with um, the question, is there, is there um, a theology of church planting in the New Testament? Um, or are we taking a practition, planting churches, and trying to find a biblical warrant for our praxis? Are we doing it um, um, an end around in that? Um, do we categorize church planting under missiology or is it ecclesiology? What, where do we, in terms of pegging it, where do we peg church planting? Is it missiology or is it ecclesiology? And then the status of church planting, is it something that should just concern the church planter or should be something that concerns the church leader? Um, and then the practical side of church planting, does the New Testament give us practical insight in how to plant churches? And I believe it does. So let's talk about um, theology of church planting. Nowhere in the Bible will you find a command, go and plant churches. Nowhere, nowhere. And yet we plant churches. Church planting is um, an offshoot or is a, a natural extension of the Great Commission. So if you make disciples, those disciples will be made into local churches. So there is a, there is a very, very pivotal um, verse in the New Testament. It's Acts chapter one, verse one, where, where Luke writes to his um, beneficiary, Theophilus, he says, I have written to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And what he implies in that is that what Jesus began in the Gospels, he is continuing or extending in the Acts of the Apostles. So if you look at the Acts of the Apostles, what is it all about? It's about evangelism and church planting. Evangelism fed into church planting. And so what Jesus began with his disciples, he continues on in the power of the Holy Spirit through disciples of Jesus to plant new churches. So um, let's talk about missiology or ecclesiology. I believe that we need to see church planting as part of missiology and that missiology leads to good ecclesiology. What came first, the church or mission? Mission or the church? And the answer is very clear. Mission came church first. Mission came first. Uh, Jesus said in John's gospel often, he said, as the Father has sent me into this world, so I send you into this world. Church exists because mission is part of the heart of God. God is in mission in this world and church is an expression of God's missionary heart. So um, I believe that ecclesiology and church planting are subsets of missiology. Look, look at this. Um, there are four functions of a local church, and I'll do a lot of diagrams, okay, that you won't find anywhere else, but 
if you do these, you'll remember what we talked about. There are four functions of a local church. This, these are not the essence of a local church, but these are four functions. The first is worship. So the church gathered worshiping the Lord. Then there's fellowship. People enjoying fellowship with one another because they're Christ's followers. Then there's disciple making. becoming students of Jesus, learning Jesus, not only learning about Jesus, but learning Jesus and expressing what we're learning in our everyday life. And there's mission. Now, as you look at these four areas in evangelical churches, they're not equally weighted. In our evangelical experience, what happens is that worship and by that, we would say the worship service is all pervasive. It, it will be um, so weighty in our local churches that this is where fellowship occurs. This is where mission seems to happen. And this is where the leaders expect to make disciples in the worship service. Now look at the Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And chapter 13. So we see the, the church at Antioch, the first planted church in the New Testament. And we read in the first three verses, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, a black man, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, look at this. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. They were doing this. They were hardcore worshipers. They were not only worship, they were fasting. Fasting does not mean they were hungering, but they were feasting on the presence of Jesus in their lives. While they were doing this, this is what happened. The Holy Spirit interrupted their worship. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. What was the Spirit of God telling this local church? That there is something on the heart of God that is more important to God than worship. What could that be? It is mission. Mission. Mission exists because worship does not yet exist. Worship exists because, a uh, mission exists because worship does not yet exist. So the Holy Spirit was, said, was saying, if you are in mission as a local church, that will lead to worship, that will lead to fellowship, that will lead to making disciples. Emil Brunner, the theologian, the Swiss theologian said, Mission exists as fire exists for burning. So fire burns. Mission is part of the essence and the function of the local church. God is in mission. The churches that emanate from God's mission are churches that are in mission. Sick and dying churches will emphasize three things. You need to write this down. Sick and dying churches... So declining plateau churches will emphasize three things. The members, the youth, and the building. The members, the youth, and the building. If you emphasize the members, the youth, and the building, you will die. It will only be a matter of time, but you will die. What are these things? These three things are very precious. Members, the youth, and the building but they're all things that the church has. The future of the church is not the members, the youth, or the building. It is always the harvest. So look at Matthew chapter 9. Look at Matthew chapter 9, and we'll pick it up at verse 32. Matthew chapter 9, and I'll give you another a diagram. So I'll ask... Um, 
introduce this passage by asking, what do demons and Christians have in common? <laughs> you say, there's nothing that they have in common. Yes, there is something that they have in common. So let's pick it up at verse 32 of, of Matthew 9. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So the, the Greek word for to drive out is ekpalo, ekpalo, to cast out, a violent casting out. And then we read this, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like the sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his happy disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to do what he does with demons, cast out, send out workers into his harvest field. What do demons and Christians have in common? They need to be cast out. <laughs> the demon has to li leave the body of the person that he's em embodied, and the, the, the people in the church need to leave the building. They need to be in mission. Um, so what we see, and Josephus said um, at that time when Jesus was alive in Galilee, where he was moving with his disciples, there lived about three million people. So imagine this. Jesus is taking his disciples where they would not normally go themselves, through every town, city, and village, to three million people. He was in the harvest. And then what was he doing? He was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the basis for church planting. We talk about a theology of church planting. This is the theological basis for church planting. Jesus was saying, there is good news. The good news is the kingdom of God, the rule of God over your life and over this world. He was preaching the gospel in the third person, but he meant himself in the first person because he was the king of the kingdom. Jesus is king, not Caesar is, is emperor. Jesus is the emperor. So what? let me draw you a picture of what it means to be preaching the good news of the kingdom. So according to the Bible, there are only two realms in which a person can live. There is my kingdom, where what I want to get done gets done. So every person in the face of, on the face of the earth begins to build his or her kingdom. They know what they want to do with their lives. They want to get good jobs. They want to have a, a family. They want to have two good late model German cars. They want their own house. They want a, a house on the lake because they need to regenerate. They want to give, have so much money that they can give 2% to the church so that they can have 98% for themselves. They are building their kingdom. And so Jesus comes and says, um, there is an alternative that I want to draw your attention to. It's called God's kingdom. Where what God wants to do gets done on earth as it is done in heaven. So when an angel is commanded by God to do something, this is what happens. An angel is... is um, initially always joyful. What? Father, you would, you would command me to do this in your name? Ah, fantastic, I would do it, of course. So an angel does it joyfully, immediately, and fully. <coughs> That's the way the kingdom of God um, is done. But between these two kingdoms, there are two very important people. You need to write this down. There is Jesus. And there is I or myself. What happens to the person who is building his or her kingdom? They will do a lot of good things with their lives. But if they're honest, they will also say that they have suffered under the things that they have produced. Maybe they have ruined their relationships. There's been a divorce or 
uh, separation between them and their children or their parents. They may have hurt their financial future. They may have hurt their physical health or emotional health. They will suffer under what they have produced. Then somebody from this session here comes to them and shares about Jesus, about the hope that they have found in Jesus. And when this person who is suffering under what he has been building hears this, he says, I had never known that Jesus came to earth to die in my place in order to give me a new life. I've never heard this before. I need Jesus. Look at what he does. He says, Jesus, you are so wonderful. Come into my life. <laughs> and you, you're getting what I'm getting at. What he's actually saying is, Jesus, come into my life and help me build my kingdom. Take away all the pain and the guilt and the shame that I have created. I, I, I confess I created all this, this junk, this garbage. Be my garbage collector. Be my waste management. Take away all this refuse. And then one day when I die, take me into heaven. And in the meantime, Leave me alone. Help me build my kingdom. It's like the person who has the, the bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. <laughs> That's the problem. God is a co-pilot, but he's the pilot. Um, the driver is the pilot. So Jesus looks at this, and the first thing he does is he laughs. He says, you're so cute, but you know, I really don't want to help you build your kingdom. It's much too small. It's much too weak. It's much too short-sighted. It doesn't have supernatural power. I am not interested in helping you build your kingdom. I invite you to enter into my kingdom where you learn what it's like to live in, in partnership with me where I am your king and I begin to influence every area of your life and we begin to change the world around you. And as we begin to change the world around you, you will reach people who are building their own kingdoms and they will be brought into my kingdom and we will then together generate new churches. So this is very, I do this drawing with non-Christians. I tell them, I ask them, what are you building? How's it going? Where are you suffering under uh, what you're building? And they're all suffering somewhere. Even the very successful people are suffering under what they've created. So we're still talking about the theological basis for church planting. We talked about the kingdom of God. We talked about God is in mission, missio dei. Um, the term missional uh, missio means um, not, not, we also derive the term missionary, which is a sent one, ekbalo, cast out one, a sent one to another cultural group. But the church within its own culture is sent to its own people to reach homogeneous units, as, as Peter Wagner would say. Um, because God is a missionary God, God's people are a missionary people. The church's mission is not secondary to its being. The church exists in being sent and in building up itself for mission. Daryl Gruder. So the church, the local church, is a missionary church. And one of our big challenges is how to get people in mission. And uh, let, me, let me show you how you can practically, in your local church, get people to be missional in their behavior. Um, so anything new that you, that you start in your church, you need to know that you will get different reactions to anything new that you try, okay? Uh, so this is a picture of the response to anything new, even to missional behavior. You have one, two, three, four different responses. 5% of your people have the first idea. Um, they generate new ideas. 15% of the, 
of your people uh, say, whatever you have as an idea, we're, we're in. We trust you, we're all in. 60% of your people respond to everything new with this response. Go ahead, but not with me. Go ahead. You need to convince me that it's good and that it works, and then I'll be involved. But you have to convince me first. So they, they take this wait and see approach. That's most of the people in your church. And then 20% of your people will step on the brakes. Whatever it is, however good it functions, they will step on the brakes and they will say, we're not getting involved. These, are the, these 20% used to be up here. They used to be above in the, 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 the forward-looking 20%, but they, they are no longer in there and they're, they've been neglected and, and they feel sort of like uh, stepchildren. So what do you do with this? You use a magic word. You use a magic word. Anything you, you try to do in a church to change it, you use a magic word, and the word is experiment. We're going to do an experiment, okay? And this is the experiment, okay? And you can do this starting this week. You get up in front of the church, and you, you hold up a, some, a drinking container. In Germany, it would be a beer stein or, or coffee or a wine, a wine glass. In your culture, it's something. And you say, for the next three months, that's how long the experiment will go. We're starting today, three months from now, we will stop the experiment. Each of us is going to invite a non-Christian in his circle of friends to a drink of their choice. They will not say no because we're paying for it, okay? As we drink something with our non-Christian friend, we will do two things. We will initially say, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? And they, they will always give us an answer to that question. Um, they will say, I'm doing great. They may say, I'm doing poorly. They may say, I don't know how I'm doing. At that point, you teach your people to say the second, to do the second step, which is, tell me more. What does that mean? Tell me more. The person says, I'm doing great. You say, tell me more. The person who says, I'm doing poorly, tell me more. Listen, write it down. Listening is the language of love today. If you have listened to a person, he knows, she knows herself to be loved by you. And then when, when they begin to unpack their lives, because tell me more is an invitation to go deep, when they begin to surface turbulence, unrest, then you teach your people to pray up courage. I have to do this all the time because I'm not a courageous person. I pray up courage and, I say, and then, then say to them, can I pray for you? And very rarely will they say no. And then all you do is you put your hand on your sho their shoulder and you, you just close your eyes and you pray in a way that won't shame them, not too loudly, but you pray for them. And as you pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is submerging this person into the presence of the triune God. You do this every week. Everybody in your fellowship does this every week for three months. And then you have a testimony time. What did you, what did you experience? What was this like for you? And what was it like for non-Christians? And if your fellowship grew by 10% as a result of this experiment, well, it becomes a part of the DNA of the church. It's no longer an experiment. It becomes a part of the life of the church. You see, only 5% of all evangelicals will, in, in, in their lifetime, lead a non-Christian to faith in Jesus. 95% of all Christians on the face of the earth are hoping putting their trust in the professionals. These are, those are you. They think, Jonas, he's, he's going to be the one who's going to take my, my neighbors to Jesus. I can't do that. So what we need to do is give people very, very easy ways 
of being missional in their behavior. And as they're missional, they're acting out the Jesus life because he was God incarnate, God incarnate. The incarnation is also a, a theological basis for church planting. So God leaving his home, coming into a different culture, this world, and emanating the life of God among people who are foreign to him. So a church needs to be incarnational. Disciples of Jesus need to be incarnational. John Stott, who we all love and know, his writings at least, when he was an old man, he knew that he was getting too weak and he never married, so he was a single man. He put himself in an old folks home, a senior citizen's home in London. But before he did that, he gave his last public address. And you know what he spoke about? The incarnation. And in that message, he said two things. The incarnation, God becoming human in Jesus was, was, it was, it only happened one time in all of history. This is, this is historical. Only one time did God ever become man. But then Stott said, but if the first incarnation is not replicated millions of times every day on the face of the earth in the, in the followers of Jesus, the children of Jesus, then the first incarnation has lost its force. So we incarnate, we incarnate the life of God. And if God were in our heart, in our, in our skin, he would be missional in his behavior. He would be in touch <coughs> with non-Christians in his daily life. So the direction of the local church is not inward, it is outward. It is always outward in its focus. An inward-focused church, members, youth, and building will die. An outward-focused church, focused on the harvest, which is the future of the church, will live. If you are lacking children's workers, if you're lacking small group workers, if you're lacking leaders in your church, you can have them in great quantities if you get them out of the harvest. They're not yet converted. They're waiting for you to come to them. And when they come to know Jesus, you can disciple them and then lead them into a life with Jesus. So what are the goals <clears throat> for a church plant? If this is a theological basis for church planting, um, it is missional in its behavior, it is incarnational, it is uh, making disciples, so it is a, an offshoot of disciple making, it is a sign of healthy a church life, it is outward and it's focused. Uh, what are the goals of a church plant? Um, prim the primary focus of church planting is that God seeks to have access to the lives of people, to their hearts. God seeks to have access to the life and to the hearts of people. God wants to live among them, among them. The tabernacle in Exodus 25, God wanting to live among his people, Israel. The temple, 1 Kings 6, God wanting to live among them. The future, Revelation 21, heaven comes down and God lives in a renewed uh, heaven and earth among his people. Jesus came and uh, lived among us. He camped among us, John 1, 14. Today, he is present in his church. So Jesus is incognito, present in his church. His church is his body, and his body will always reflect the head and the heart of the one who embodies the body. God wants growth, and through his church, he will see growth happen. What is a, uh, when is a church... Um, what is a church plant? How can we define that? It is, this is a church plant, the reproduction of a dynamic community with God. So these are people who live learning Jesus, following him together in Christ that is steered by a gifted leadership. You can't plant churches without gifting who generates the connection to Christ and Christians. So the, the, 
the people who are in following Jesus become a bridge between the found world and the lost world, connecting them, and then who carry out the sending in word and deed. The intermediate goal is a, a church is planted when the gospel is being preached. Jesus is the king of his kingdom. He wants more than manage your sin and give you a wonderful future. He wants to manage your life. He wants to be the authority. The gospel is preached. People bow under the lordship of Jesus. Um, they belong to the Lord. And worship is always reactive behavior. God shows himself to us and we respond with yes with yielding to him. Um, so the word submission, um, submitted to his mission. If you are submitted to the king, you are submitted to his mission. And uh, that is worship. Um, Christians grow in their trust to, in Jesus and live committed to one another, and leadership is set in place. That is sort of a very, very cursory um, uh, image of when a church is planted, when, when healthy leadership is in place, and it is making its own theology huh, that is, that is um, homegrown, that is missional in its, in its behavior. And it is always looking to plant itself somewhere else. So um, the, health, the healthy, uh, healthy church is a church that is healthy enough to reproduce itself, and the, the question that we need to face is what is the gestation period of our churches? It takes a female between insemination and birth nine months. It takes a female elephant two years to bear an elephant baby. It takes a, a female mouse between about 10, 20 days to bear between five and 10 mice, 20 days. A female mouse will birth, give birth to five to 10 mice. That's why you go to your, uh, to your store and you buy mouse traps and not elephant traps because mice become a plague. What is the gestation period of your denomination? How long does it take for a church after its birth to birth another church? That is the $64 million question in terms of church planting. Has your church birthed a new church? And how long does it take for that church to birth another church? And then for the daughter churches, the granddaughter churches to birth another church? The secret is generational distance. So let's talk about a good church planting church. This is the mother, mother church. She will bear a daughter church. Um, then she has to, like mothers do, they have to um, um, get healthy, get strong, and then another daughter church, and then sometime down the road, another daughter church, another daughter church. This is a good church planting church, but it will never be a great church planting church because it's all tied to the strength of the mother. And there will come a time where the mother will be exhausted. Well, she will say, I can't do this anymore. There will come a time when she's sati satiated. Now, this is a great church planting church. You have the mother who plants a daughter church, and you can replicate this, plants daughter churches. But then these daughter churches plant daughter churches. These daughter churches plant daughter churches. Every daughter church plants daughter churches, and, and not only two, but many, until the fifth generation. Why is the fifth generation so significant? Because when you get to a fifth generation, you no longer need the first cause anymore. You have built up a momentum, a movement, that will sort of take care of itself. Let me give you an example. My wife's grandparents, uh, lived to be, um, well, they were married for over 75 years. Grandfather lived to be 105. Grandmother died when she was 97. They had seven children. And before they died, they, they had already left a progeny of 150 people. 
we have a picture of them holding a baby in the fifth generation. Now, was that baby produced by my wife's grandparents? And the answer is no. But the answer is yes, indirectly. Through the power of indirect influence, that baby was born. Had it not been for the great-grandparents, that great-great-great-great-grandchild would never have come to be born. So this is the power of movement. It is getting away from the first cause because missional behavior is in the DNA of every planted church. And when you get to a fifth generation, you will get to a movement. And the question is always, how long does it take for a healthy church to plant another church? Um, I know of um, a church in the Los Angeles area that never gets beyond 50 members, but it plants a new church every year. So every year it sends out between 10 and 15 of its own members to plant a new church every year. This is significant. You don't have to be a big church to be a church planting church. You need to be a healthy church, a healthy church. And let me close by sharing with you the most significant Bible passage in my life in the last 10 years. You need to write this down. It's Acts 16, verses 4 to 5. And I'll leave you with this challenge because it is huge. As they traveled, now these are the first missionary church planters and evangelists, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. Here, here it comes. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. What is this verse saying? It is not saying what I supposed it was saying for years. It is not saying that the numbers of disciples in these churches grew daily in numbers. What it is saying is that the churches themselves were growing daily in numbers. Every day in the New Testament era, there were newly planted churches. Every day. That is, in the New Testament era, we already had movement going on. And what we need in Europe especially is um, a movement of newly planted churches that would be so strong that would, you could not stop it. One of the metaphors for movement is a flood in, in the Old Testament. A flood is a deluge of, of a water density that is so strong that it exceeds the bounds of the river that is trying to keep it contained. You cannot contain it anymore. So a movement is something that will get away from us. We cannot control it anymore. We cannot administrate it. It is so powerful that the Spirit of God is, is just causing it to, to break all of the bounds that we have set up up to that point. That is what we need in Europe. And you can be a part of that by praying and going and doing it with others and, and being Jesus to those in your, in your environment.